So, uh, yeah, my name's James Lowy. I'm the, the CIO at uh, TGen, or the Translational Genomics Research Institute based in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is how we're utilizing Docker to help with our genomics workflow uh, and kind of the story behind how we ended up getting into that, into that uh, technology. So first we'll talk a little bit about TGen and, and what we do. I think it's good to kind of get a level set. Um, so we're a, a nonprofit uh, that's focused on, you know, looking at how genetic changes and the mechanisms uh, of, of your genetic makeup, um, you know, have an, uh, a capacity to affect disease. So kind of in a nutshell, if we want to really think about it, it's taking discoveries in the laboratory uh, around DNA and taking those and translating those into treatments for patients. So we're very patient focused. We're very much uh, in tune with wanting to help people. So I've been with TGen for a little over 14 years now. Um, I was brought on originally to build high performance computing systems and I built uh, two systems in the top 500 supercomputers uh, in my tenure there. So, you know, it's, uh, I came from, from kind of that background and with a, with a high school biology education. So I've had to learn a lot um, as, as we've gone along. Um, so I'll start the story uh, talking about a conversation that occurred in, a, in an elevator. So I was sitting in, in an elevator and one of our primary researchers turns to me and says, hey, by the way, we just bought three of these sequencing machines that are going to produce probably about four terabytes of data a piece every week. And I said, boy, that's really good to know, because um, this was back in, in 2008. And that's four terabytes a week seemed like a lot of data, uh, especially since our largest uh, storage system at the time uh, was about, about 14 terabytes total. So, you know, we had to start thinking on our feet and going through some iterations to, you know, really try to cope with that volume of data. So, of course, what ends up happening is you end up with this scenario. You end up with researchers that have decided that they want to store all their own data. So literally, this is in one of our researchers' offices. These are all USB hard drives, right, that, that they've collected, that it's full of, of genomic data. Um, we're also looking at the, the folder structure of one folder for one lab and what it looks like. You know, it's 70 terabytes of data, you know, with a, a, about, uh, you know, 32 million files or so on there. And so, this is, this is like a huge thing and, and operationally is having a, a major effect on, on IT and how we're doing IT. So, you know, this, this USB hard drive thing went, went okay until they started dying, right? And then all of a sudden the researchers came back to IT and said, hey, we do need, need your help. We can't do all this on our own because, you know, we've just had some data loss and so now we want to put some enterprise type systems in place to actually manage and, and cope with uh, the data that's coming off the sequencers. So to kind of give you an idea of, uh, you know, of the work that we've been doing within TGen that's driving this data growth, we can look at this timeline and see these various disorders um, that, uh, that TGen's been dealing with over the years and some of the things that we're looking uh, towards the future. Um, and these numbers of about 3,000 exomes and genome sequenced is, are kind of out of date. We're actually uh, closer to, closer to 5,000 at this point. The sequencing technology has continued to evolve. Um, so the volume of genetic data that we're able to process continues to increase. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, just in the last couple of weeks, we got a new sequencer that's actually doubling output to over eight terabytes a week per sequencer. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really looking at, you know, just immense amounts of data uh, that, that requires a huge amount of computation and storage. So, you know, as you, you can see, we run the gamut um, from, we're primarily focused around oncology and cancer, and I think precision medicine in general, that's the, that's the kind of the current target. Um, 
but that doesn't preclude other disorders and other things that we're, that we're wanting to address. Uh, because as I mentioned earlier, we're very patient focused. We want to take care of people and to help people. So, you know, I'm sure everybody knows somebody who's suffering from one ailment or another. And, you know, what we want to be able to do is provide the right, tr the right treatment at the right time to these people so that they can get better without having all these horrible side effects of chemo and all these other things. So, you know, it's really, it really boils down to, you know, this is, this is why we want to do this, right, is to help people. So as uh, anybody who was in the keynote this morning probably saw the picture of, of Shelby, and uh, these are actually two of the scientists that, uh, that were uh, involved with her in, uh, in, in her treatments. And this is the, what really drives me, is being able to meet a little girl like that, who basically was a non-functional human being in a lot of respects, to somebody who's you know, up around dancing. She was on the stage with the governor of Arizona a couple of years ago at a state of the state uh, address, you know, just as a, an example of what, you know, biomedical science and biomedical research can do. Um, so, you know, my, my role in that is to build better, faster uh, systems and also to contain costs as much as possible because we figure every dollar that we spend on computer infrastructure is a dollar that's taken away from the pure research um, that's so important. Um, and really, you know, we've been fortunate to, to have uh, a great group of folks in my IT department that have enabled us to, to do this stuff. Um, as they kept promoting me, what happens is they suck your brain out more. Um, and when you become a C-level person, if I get on a command line, then, then my engineers get mad at me. Uh, so probably for good reason. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, it really is, it's a team effort. So, and not just with the, the, the computer people, but it's also being able to, to translate the scientific requirements into systems, right? So that's really, really important. Um, some of the things that we're looking at moving forward that I think are really exciting and, and will also help drive some of the requirements uh, are things like uh, circulating DNA. So basically the idea that you can take a blood sample and sequence DNA fragments from disease like cancer in that blood sample for earlier detection of disease. Um, a good example would be pancreatic cancer that generally isn't detected until it's at stage three or four, and by then it's, the treatment options are really limited. Wouldn't it be great if we could take a blood sample, sequence it, and find some of those abnormal uh, DNA fragments from the cancer and get it at stage one when, we're, when we have a much wider uh, array of options to, to treat the patient? Um, we're also working on things like concussion. So we've, we've conducted a, a study with uh, Arizona State University's football team, uh, putting sensors in their helmets, taking uh, uh, samples from the players after they've taken big hits, um, and then actually looking at uh, you know, what kind of genetic changes and possibly even identifying concussion without having to necessarily uh, uh, go through the, the, the known medical procedures, which we, you know, we found aren't always entirely accurate. So it's, you know, I'm trying to, trying to do that kind of stuff. And then, you know, that ties into, into Internet of Things is another area that we're spending a lot of time thinking about and looking at. Um, and it's really boils down to, you know, to pay, uh, wearables and monitoring uh, technologies. Uh, you know, things like, uh, uh, you know, a Fitbit or Apple Watch or whatever. And, you know, being able to look at, like, say, sleep patterns that change. Uh, we know that there's correlation between sleep patterns and, and detection of Alzheimer's disease, for example. Um, wouldn't it be great if, you know, we could predict with some level of, uh, uh, of significance, you know, disease once again before uh, any kind of, you know, any kind of really major side effect appears. So, uh, you know, I believe that the, all these things, of course, are going to be creating more and more data. So, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, how are we going to how are we going to deal with all that? Um, and then I think the, the 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 last driver around this is in in downstream analytics. And this this chart uh, illustrates basically 
kind of the timeline and, and of infrastructure and 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 uh, software that that's been required um, to do a lot of these things and where it's going. So you know we're looking at originally when we were sequencing we we're you know grabbing terabytes of data and having to run this through a high performance compute cluster and you know this was something we were there was no cookbook or, or recipes or anything so we kind of had to figure it out as we went. Uh, but now, uh, you know, it's pretty well figured out, you know, and as a matter of fact, you can go to, to some manufacturers and, and purchase uh, an appliance to run sequences through. Um, so I'd say that that problem is pretty well solved. Um, now we're starting to look more at some of the, 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 this, the downstream pieces. Uh, and what I mean by that is data coming from other sources like the IoT that I showed earlier or medical uh, record systems, electronic medical record systems uh, like Epic or Cerner, and actually taking that data and combining it with the genomic data to really help us uh, you know, gain more insight into what's going on. Uh, and I think when we get to probably another couple, two, probably two to three years down the road, the sequencing part's just gonna be simple. You're just gonna go give a blood sample or a solid tumor sample or whatever, and you know, the sequencing will be done in, in a day and you will, you know, that you basically they'll find all the variants and be able to produce a report on, you know, what, how to deal with that, whether it's doing preventative medicine or if it's, you know, going towards some kind of a, a drug treatment or anything like that. Where the heavy lifting is gonna be happening is, is in much more, uh, I'm hoping in the predictive side and actually looking at lifestyle data, IoT data, uh, maybe other sensors in your home. Uh, to to actually, you know, be able to kind of prognosticate what's going on with you. So say, hey, if you make a lifestyle change now, it's going to most likely result in, in not getting, you know, a type of cancer later. Or, you know, if you change this particular part of your diet, then, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll feel better, you'll be more healthy because, because we can detect these things. And this is, this is definitely... Where this where this stuff is going. So, with with that being said, um, I'll talk a little bit now about the the infrastructure and 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 the things that we're doing on the IT side. So, you know, hopefully, this has been helpful in kind of laying some groundwork uh, to to kind of understand you know what what it is that what, that we want to accomplish. So today, in our existing HPC architecture, it's pretty typical for a. Uh, Genomics-based HPC shop. We've got several different types of, uh, uh, of infrastructure. We have Luster. We have Isilon. We've got uh, you know a bunch of compute boxes, um, and basically it's kind of the workflows. The sequencer runs, writes to Luster. We pull out all the the base calls or, or the actual DNA data from that go through and do what they call a read alignment, which is basically taking uh, the DNA and comparing it to known DNA, although the known DNA uh, is constantly evolving because uh, as we learned, there used to be part of DNA they called junk DNA, and we kind of figured out, well, now it's not really junk because there's actually important stuff, even though it isn't obvious how it's coding. Um, so, so it's, that's what's cool is it's constantly evolving. So this, this infrastructure has served us well. And, and basically in the research environment, I think is, is, is an adequate infrastructure to, to do the science. But as I mentioned, we wanna treat patients. We want to help people. So now we have to think about, you know, what's gonna happen with a clinic, right? So then you get fun stuff like HIPAA, CLIA, um, uh, FDA, all these fun, fun uh, regulations. So then you have to really start thinking about how you architect these systems because now you're using the computer system as an actual diagnostic test. Uh, so there's a whole realm of regulations and things around that. So we've, you know, that means that we're gonna have to change some stuff. So in today's, today's HPC environment, we use a bunch of different tools, um, and this is just a, a sampling of, of some of these, but uh, you know, we, we really wanna uh, uh, you know, give our researchers as much freedom as possible to run the jobs that they want and not to interfere with that at all. 
So you know, it basically leads to an environment that, that has a wide variety of codes running on it, a wide variety of technologies. Um, I, I like to say that we're very technology agnostic, uh, that we try to pick the best tools for the job. Um, but you know, probably, I don't know, probably about two and a half years ago, maybe three years ago, I really started thinking about that clinical piece and it was bugging me because I'm thinking, you know, how, the, th then the only way I could figure out how to do that was to build another cluster to basically run that work and that's all that could run on it. So I'm gonna have a bunch of machines that'll be busy when we're processing clinical samples and maybe not so busy when we're not. And, and you know, as an HPC guy, man, utilization, I want, I want high utilization. I don't, wasted cycles, you know, turning electricity into heat doesn't interest me. I want something useful to happen. So I started looking into, into containers and, and uh, uh, Docker in particular. Um, and it's like, man, this is really cool. Uh, you know, what if, we were, what if we were to take this workflow and then, you know, put it into, into the Dockerized world? Uh, and, you know, how, can, how would that look, right? Um, so what we've been working on is, you know, kind of porting over that workflow into container-based. So there was a couple of technologies that, that I thought had to be part of that. Um, uh, you know, Docker was obviously one because it's kind of ubiquitous. There's a huge ecosystem. I love this conference; is awesome. Uh, I went to to Docker uh, DockerCon last year in Seattle, and that's really got my brain thinking about this. And uh, you know, so it's, it, it, that's important having that community, having the support. Um, the other the other piece was in, around storage because obviously, as I, as I mentioned, we've had you know, huge amounts of, of data being generated, and and how do we do this? And then you know, so, so actually uh, through a, a, a former product, uh, some, some folks approached me from uh, Portworks and they basically said, hey, we're working on this container-based storage. And I said, you know, hey, I'm in, I wanna, I wanna learn about this. And uh, so, so we've worked very closely with them to, to you know, help, uh, you know, help uh, uh, implement their product within our workflows. Uh, and We've been we've been pretty pleased with the performance and everything and the responsiveness of, the, of their team. So, you know, really a, a big thanks to them because it was that was an important part of the whole workflow was getting that storage piece right. So, you know, then then we're looking at uh, uh, you know what what did that mean? So it's all about persistence. So, think about it like this. So in in a lab today, you get a blood test and they run some chemistry on it and you get results, right? So chemistry is pretty static. It's kind of like physics, it's immutable, right? Um, now we're talking about lab tests being done in silico and from a, a former life of mine working in the aviation industry, I, I knew that you know, the lifespan of a piece of computer code can outlast the technology that actually ran that code. Take, ask anybody who's tried to port vector mainframe based code over to a risk processor, for instance. Um, that's fun times, but, uh, you know, so we wanted to, to create something that was this immutable thing. So we, when we run a laboratory test, we can put it into a container and then ship it off to an archive. And if we need to rerun it two years down the road or five years down the road, all we gotta do is pull the container out and run it. So. You know, I think that that was a, that was a really uh, important uh, important piece of that. So, you know, these are kind of the underlying infrastructure pieces. But in the, I want to present a slide here of of kind of the bigger picture, and you know, thinking about the whole ecosystem and how we would apply this and how we would do this. And uh, one of our scientists actually came up with this container mania idea, um, and. You know, basically what this is, is taking data being generated, you know, in the sequencing lab, in your CLIA certified sequencing lab, putting it, you know, into a containerized workflow, running it through data analytics, and coming up with a, a patient report that is actionable by physicians. And this means that a whole lot of other stuff has to take place because these, these things don't happen in a vacuum. So we're gonna have to create these bridges um, with 
you know, the healthcare uh, uh, systems and some of the technologies that, that they deal with. And if, uh, you know, I don't know if there's anybody here who works in healthcare, but, you know, things like HL7 and, and Fire and, and some of the other, other technologies that are coming around are changing how genomic information is gonna be stored in the future into, uh, into medical record systems, electronic medical record systems. Because up to this point, that's something that, frankly, they weren't real interested in because it wasn't being viewed as, you know, necessary. So uh, I, I believe that, uh, you know, the, the, the Precision Medicine Initiative that was launched, you know, by the federal government a couple of years ago is really driving a lot of these things forward. Um, and it's moving from the academic setting, from the labs, you know, into mainstream healthcare. Uh, and what that means is that we have to start thinking about things like this. You know, how are we gonna run this in a secure manner, in a manner that's reproducible, um, which is really important, um, and in a manner that, uh, that is, is easy to take and move somewhere else. So it's like, I don't wanna just, you know, build my own unique snowflake that only is TGen centric and that's all, you know. I wanna build something that I can come to conferences like this or to BioIT World or, or whatever and be able to talk about and get people thinking about because I believe that doing this sort of thing is what's gonna make a difference, you know, in people's lives, right? I mean, this is, this is gonna be the underlying technology that's gonna help medicine evolve to the next level. We're gonna move into a, an era, I believe, that is gonna be much healthier people who, you know, are not gonna be getting these treatments that, you know, basically almost kill them to try to get rid of the cancer, right? We wanna have precision things. We wanna, we, wanna use, we wanna use the sniper rifle, not the shotgun. And so really, you know, that's thinking about this whole ecosystem, you know, is, is important. Kind of dive into it a little bit. Um, we're, you know, we're, this is an example workflow with some of the uh, microservices around a particular uh, analysis. So basically what we're doing is we're taking, uh, taking the DNA, which the, so you have different terms here and, and let me explain a little. So, so with these, so it says merge fast queues. So fast queues are basically the unaligned reads. So if you think about that, what that is is, uh, it's the, it's the data that's been coming off the sequencer raw. So you then take that, align it, and then, and then you're actually able to call out what we call variants or abnormalities in the, in the DNA. And what's cool is, is that during these processes, there's all these sub-processes that can run or may not run depending upon what you're looking for. So that's why you see things kind of off to the side. Those aren't critical to the whole workflow, but they're things that are still could be important based upon what you're trying to discover. Um, so we go through, we're aligning, uh, we, then we look for, for what we call duplicates, these things that are just, because the sequencers aren't perfect, they're a lot better than they used to be, but we still see error rates, you know, from anywhere from, from, from 2% to 10%, to depending upon a variety of factors. So you kind of have to take that, that noise out of your, out of your sequence. Uh, and then you're gonna be actually looking for, for things like uh, gene expression, where it's like, hey, you've got a, a gene that's overexpressed, or here the RNA, which is actually what signals the gene, you know, is talking, uh, uh, maybe talking a little too loud and, and doing things that it shouldn't be, um, to finally, you know, breaking it down to some statistical analysis, basically running it through uh, to, to find out, and then what, would happen downstream from here in the clinical reporting side is then you would be looking at actionable genes. And what I mean by that is genes that, that it's known, uh, they're known drug compounds that can be used to, to uh, affect, that, affect that gene. Um, so I know, I know that, to, that this, is, this is kind of a lot, but as I said, I have to keep thinking about it and keep doing it. And part of the reason that I wanted to, to present here today was to you know maybe elicit some conversation uh, and, and ideas because I think you know really you know we we all have to work together to to you know to help build these things because they are extremely complex they're constantly evolving and you know as I said there's no there's no cookbook 
for doing this stuff. It's it's uh, it's we're right in it, uh, and so you know these are some of the the technologies and some of the things that 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 we that I'm thinking about and what we're thinking about is you know downstream is where the good stuff is. I'm I'm convinced that when we start pulling together you know phenotypic data, genotypic data, lifestyle data that it's going to have a huge impact in how we look at disease and how we treat disease. Um, you know, there's going to be all these different data types of so actually getting good data that's clean and in a format that you can actually use it uh, is, is really hard um, because it's coming from all these different uh, places. And so that's, that's a, that's a, that's a tough challenge. And then of course, of course the, the politics around some of these things are, are tough. I mean, hospitals and healthcare organizations have been doing things like they've been doing things for a long time. And, and although there's a lot of forward thinking uh, organizations out there, um, there's a lot that aren't. And, and you know, it's like, uh, I, I would venture to guess that you know, out of this room, probably, probably, you know, 15% maybe of people here have doctors who are well versed in, in DNA and understand genetics really well. Uh, so that's something that's going to have to happen. And then the legal issues around all these things, what is personal identifiable information? I would argue your genome is probably the most personally identifiable piece of information you have. Uh, but that's still, you know, but how do we balance that then with the need to, to do research and to share data and to work with other people? Um, and then I'm a, I'm a big advocate uh, myself of, of patients owning their own data. Uh, so what I mean by that is, is you know, say you have a, a doctor who has a portal and uh, it has your test results or whatever, but it's, it stays in their portal and, and you can look at it, but you don't really own it. You know, I'd like to be able to carry around uh, my genome and all my, all my other medical history and everything else, you know, and an encrypted USB key or something that then I could go to the doctor and, and you know, give so that, because the more data that they have, the better decisions that they're going to make. Uh, so, you know, a lot of different technologies, it's constantly evolving. Uh, and I really, you know, it's, as I said, I, I would love to hear uh, folks' ideas around, you know, some of the things maybe they're involved with uh, to, to enhance uh, our, you know, our ability to, to all work together to really you know come up with better better ways to improve human health. Um, so with that, I, I would just like to say thank you to a few folks, obviously to uh, the Portworx team and all the hard work that they've done in building a, a storage system that I believe is going to allow us to, to to move this this kind of technology into the clinic faster. Um, Dell EMC has been a great partner with us, as well as our. Uh, some of our researchers, Dr. David Craig, Dr. Matt Hunnelman, Dr. Jonathan Keats, who are some of the smartest guys I know. It's like uh, working in a genomics institute, I joke that IT are the dumb people there. Um, and then also uh, Nelson Keck, my HPC manager, and the entire HPC team who basically do all the heavy lifting and, and uh, make it possible for me to stand up here and tell you about the things that we're doing. And with that, I would uh, take any questions. Excellent talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I have questions regarding uh, your workflows. Which tools uh, are you using for it? Because I understand that the slides that you showed uh, RNA workflow when you have fast FASTA files and uh, all the flow. Uh, you use uh, some type of pipelines or? So, uh, yeah. yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, in workflow management, that's something that, that we're still looking at. So, so we're, we've been working with things like Swarm and, and Kubernetes and, uh, and I think in, from our early experimentation, I'm not sure that those are going to be a good fit for what we're doing. Um, you know, a lot of the technology around around Docker has been focused on web scale type of stuff, and it's a it's a little bit different than than what we're working on. But that's something I'm certainly would love to you know love to learn some more about, and you know maybe there's some other technologies that we should be looking at. Okay, thank you. Hi. Um, can you spell out for me exactly how containers are going to help your security posture with things like HIPAA? So, yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, 
being able to, to actually isolate workloads away um, from the general population is what we see. So, and I think that it's, it was really encouraging to me to be out on the show floor today and see several vendors out there talking about container security. I, when we first started looking at it, it was my, my security people asked me the same question. So it's, uh, you know, what, what are you thinking? Um, I said, well, I think what I think is that the, the idea is fundamentally sound. I think the technology will catch up. And I think that's indeed what is happening, uh, you know, with that. So the, Basically, what I'd like to be able to do is run my containerized workflows on the same machinery that I'm running my R&D on, but it, it, being able to do it in such a way that, that the risk uh, auditors and folks are comfortable with. Is there any advantage over like a VM or a bare metal server? So yeah, performance. So it's, uh, you know, that's, that's what really got me interested in Docker's IBM had written a, paper a few years ago about running uh, HPC benchmarks in containers and they saw, I think it was like a five to 15% performance of penalty versus 20 plus when you're running in VMs. So we want to go fast and, and VMs just, you know, they're great, no, no knock on them at all, but, but they're just not a, not a good fit for what we're trying to do. Thank you. Hi, um, I was pretty encouraged to see you on the roster uh, because uh, I've got genomics HPC guys as my customers as well um, and I'm uh, I've been dockerizing our compute uh, environment with an eye to the cloud um, usage that we've got planned uh, first of all are you doing any compute in the cloud on genomics data yeah, so, so today we're, we've run some experimental workflows in Azure, um, and we're looking at doing this for like, as I mentioned, the, the, uh, uh, the, the reference genomes change, and so what happens every time they release a new one, everybody wants to run and re realign everything against it. And that's the kind of workflow I think would be perfect in the cloud where it's not necessarily as time sensitive. Uh, I think in the clinical setting, running it locally is is the better way to go, simply because it's faster. I don't have to transfer data up and you know to and from, so I, I can do it all in the same building, so that, or at least in the same city, uh, and that really you know kind of drives that. But that being said, uh, I think uh, you know the goal of of running in containers. Well, one of the big goals is to be able to have that transportable workload. We do a lot of work with partners uh, across the world, and we'd love to be able to just package up some of the things we do and ship it to them, you know, so they can run it wherever. I, I, I want to be totally agnostic to it. So I guess um, I, I was, I've was i been talking to all the container storage vendors <laughs> um, in the hall, and of course Portworks uh, told me to, uh, to catch your um, <laughs> presentation because uh, they work with you. Um, but... Um, so, because I guess that's the that's the big question mark we see looming as we as we look at something like a cloudburst is is uh, is you know uh, genomics data to process it in the cloud you got to get it into the cloud and you you want decent performance and you know you obviously you want multiple compute nodes to be able to access the same big files you know mm -hmm. yeah exactly and and you know that's we we have been working with the Portworks guys on doing that right so. Um, as I said, this is this is a lot of new stuff, and we're, we're. I mean, if you do HPC, you know we love to twist things in a strange and wonderful ways, and uh, and so, uh, yeah. I think I think you know we're not. I, I can't say we're one hundred percent there today, but but clearly that's that's what we want to accomplish as well. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. In uh, the pipeline slide you had up with the uh, analysis. Uh, component, do you allow, uh, do you have like a curated set of Docker images that you allow the researchers to use? Um, do you allow people to submit their own? How do you manage that? That's a, that's a great question. And frankly, that's still something we're, you know, we're deciding. So there's, there's advantages and disadvantages to both. I think on the clinical side, it'll all be curated because we have to run in validated workflows. So that means basically it's static. So the, and we're just going to optimize it, put it in a container, and that's what it runs. Um, in the research side, 
I'm more inclined to provide baseline containers for folks who want to use them. But I, I, I'm a big believer in, in letting folks do what they want to do on the system because that's how innovation happens, I think. So, uh, you know, building an ecosystem that's going to be supportive of folks doing that and still having some level of control over it, that's, that's going to be a challenge. Um, and something, frankly, I've thought about and I don't have an answer to today. Any more? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, one more question. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to hear your opinion on uh, privacy of your genomic data. As you expressed that you would like to be able to carry your genes around with you in the USB stick, but as you probably know, of course, uh, a single genome doesn't really give that much data, so it's all about the combination of all the genes from people that have been sequenced. So what's your thought about how, the, how we get there? Yeah, no, I, I, that's a great point. Yeah, I mean, when I say I can carry around in my genome, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to carry around my whole genome. I'm only going to carry around the interesting bits, because you're exactly right. It's, um, and one of the things that's really interesting and, and that we're actually working on uh, with some of our computational biologists is, uh, doing really large-scale studies on whole genome data. Uh, and frankly, there's some huge technical challenges to doing that, not just in the infrastructure, but in, in the math around it. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think, I think you're right that, that it's the, the really big data is when you start munging together a lot of genomes. You know, the, the variant file data, so like the variants being the abnormalities that are interesting, you know, probably, yeah, it's probably, I don't know, it's like 7K to a couple megabytes maybe. So it's, it's not that, that, you know, that's not big, but it's important to me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think, I think uh, you know, we're, we're getting to the point, we have one project that's, that's uh, sequenced uh, over, over a, a thousand individuals, and they're going to be following these people for, I believe, 10 years and resequencing them upon recurrence of disease. And this is where it starts getting really interesting uh, because we're going to look for the genetic alterations that happen with recurrence. You know, why did, it, uh, you know, why did this uh, signal, we stopped it here, and now it's gone around. Because that's the, that's the thing to remember is that cancer, cancer evolves really quickly, uh, and it's not a static thing. So it's not like you get sequenced and boom, that's it forever and ever. It's, you get sequenced, and it probably should be resequenced. You know, five, ten years down the road, or if you have some kind of serious illness, you know, I don't know, hang out in a radioactive zone. But, you know, there's all these different things that affect you uh, and could change your genome. So, it's maybe it's it's carrying around not just that moment in time, but maybe a whole history of your of your genetics. So, cool. Well, thank you very much.